Mr. Ravala, what do you make of the report itself? You are coming to us from the UK, and really, who is to blame yes. about that war? So the report is, has been called one of the most detailed analyses of any foreign policy that's ever been written. And it's 2.6 million words, it's 12 volumes long, and it's a very thorough account of all the different steps of the policy making process that led to the invasion and then what happened after the invasion in British politics, in military planning, in diplomatic mm. uh, planning. It, what I think is interesting about it, and this is I think something that um, hasn't been fully appreciated yet, is the extent to which it's not just looking to blame people. It does have criticisms of individuals, but its most central criticism is not about individual leaders, it's not about institutions, it's about the way in which British foreign policy thinks about itself, right. about the very nature of British foreign policy, and the ways in which people in Britain haven't been asking, what is our foreign policy for, for, for a very long time. If you could, uh, if you could, uh, if you could, yeah. uh, Mr. Ravala, I'll give you 40 seconds if you can, sir, to help us briefly sure, understand, sure, okay. according to the report, how the foreign policy of the UK was being drawn, particularly in the build up to the war, if so, you can. Yeah. So, so the central concern of British foreign policy in the lead up to the war was about attaining influence with the United States. That's what the report says, that it was centrally organized around how to influence the United States. The idea that Britain gets a bigger say in world affairs by being a close ally of the United States. And the report is saying explicitly that it wasn't asked why we want influence in international affairs. What's the purpose of influence? What goal is to be achieved through mm. having influence with the United States? And secondly, it says that by being close to the United States, it doesn't mean you get more influence with them. They take you for granted instead. That's right. Which is what happened after 2003. Rather than you getting influenced by, 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 by acclaiming your loyalty with the United States, instead right. you're left sidelined in the decision making process. So it's a more general criticism than a criticism of just one person or one Mr. leader. Mr. Blank. It's a more general criticism of yeah. the nature of foreign policy. Mr. Blank, therefore, let me go to yes. you. What exactly is it? Of course, the debate inside the UK, as being illustrated by Mr. Ramallah, is influence the means or is influence the goal? From the Washington perspective, what do you make of it? Well, I think that this was an exceptionally useful study for exactly the reasons discussed. It shows how British policy making occurs. From the Washington perspective, though, a lot of this has been utterly irrelevant. The decisions about the Iraq war were made within the White House and a very small circle outside it, largely in the Department of Defense and a few other places within Washington. And from an American perspective, it's useful to remember that President Barack Obama ran on a platform opposed to the Iraq war. Both presidential candidates, likely candidates right now, call the Iraq war a, a tragic mistake and a solid majority of the American people thoroughly agree. So in the U.S., a lot of this uh, decision making has already been discredited. Mm. But at the same time, we have been hearing, uh, of course, a lot of criticism. But at the same time, do we have like official version of what went wrong inside the United States? Those are responsible decision makers along the production no, line. Uh, no, we do not. And this is one of the reasons that this is one of the reasons the Chilcot report is so important. Britain has done what we in the U.S. have not done, which is perform what the military calls an after action report, mm. going back and in detail looking at what went right and more importantly, what went wrong so that we don't make the same mistakes in the future that we've made in the past. Right. Well, Mr. Mansour, you've been listening to your two other colleagues. The question is, after knowing what went wrong, whether those mistakes will be corrected and whether similar mistakes will be made or will be avoided in the future, what do you think? For example, the war in Iraq and also many of the military conflicts and wars later. Yeah. Well, I think definitely, um, as, as has been said, 
um, it was clear that the the war went wrong, and I think everyone in this in this part of the region, it's, it's you know, isn't a big guess for them to say that something went wrong. The war went wrong, um, and so you have this idea that maybe the UK and the US, maybe their interventions aren't necessarily uh, a good thing. Um, in, in an effort to democratize what they did in Iraq, uh, unfortunately, was destabilize the institutions that governed the country, um, created ungoverned spaces that allowed uh, different actors to emerge, and really allowed Iraq to become another uh, battleground for different proxy wars and different uh, interests, mm. Not that none of which being Iraqi interests. Um, so definitely, from from the perspective of Iraqis, it's it's it, it is. I mean, they are kind of surprised that the, uh, a country like the U the UK would have this level of accountability for a major foreign policy decision, but at the same time, not so much surprise uh, coming um, that you know it did go wrong. And obviously, in terms of flawed intelligence, mm. it was clear that, for example, weapons of mass destruction were not found. Right, uh, Mr. Ravala, though, at this moment. Even with this report as thick as for war and peace, the novel itself, we also heard from mm -hmm. some of the key decision makers, for example, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair was still very firm in his rhetoric suggesting a world without Saddam Hussein is much better than the world with. He probably has his point. The question is how much price did we pay for getting rid of Saddam Hussein yes. and getting rid of the regime? I think that is the issue here. But are we asking the right questions? And meanwhile, the loopholes, mm -hmm. as being suggested in the report, you've rightly pointed out, uh, uh, Mr. Rabala, uh, will those systematic problems be fixed? Who will fix yes. it, given your government status right now? Th those are two very good questions. I think in the first of those, the effect upon the region, this was, this was one of the, the strongest parts of the report. It did review Mr. Blair's account, it did review the reasons that he's been giving since 2003, and showed quite systematically why they were wrong, why the arguments that were made by Mr. Blair and his supporters don't work in trying to under understand what was achieved through the invasion. So it, it is quite a thorough account of what of what the problems are of the arguments that we heard from Mr. Blair yesterday. Mm. On the question of who will fix these problems, that's a much more serious problem because at the moment in Britain we have a political paralysis as a consequence of the decision to leave the European Union in which there is no effective government and there is no effective opposition to that government. So in some ways this report is coming out at a very bad time in British politics where attention is placed elsewhere but the, on the other hand, this is a moment in which many in Britain are sitting back and thinking, what's our politics for? What's our, what's our objective in the world? How can we rethink our role now that we've left the European Union? And in that way, the report does fit into a broader debate about what Britain's role in global affairs is in mm. the 21st century. Mr. Blank, I'm afraid, as you mentioned, the same thing also in the United States. Of course, uh, politicians, they go with their administration, but the question is, the things they have done, should they be responsible for that? And the systematic mistake, so-called no smoking gun at all, uh, who should be responsible for that? Who will help them responsible? And eventually, will those uh, loopholes be fixed? Mr. Blank. Very, a very good question. We in the US do not have a good mechanism to bring that sort of accountability. The political process is the best way we have and it has not really brought any kind of accountability. One of the most tragic elements, in my view, is the fact that by not having any sort of public accounting the way the UK has had of, for example, our torture policy, mm. we used to have a, a consensus that torture was morally wrong and ineffective as a tool of policy. We're now seeing that consensus erode and it would be very dangerous if torture were again brought back into the, uh, the U.S. arsenal. Mm. We are playing some of the uh, backgrounders on our screen earlier with uh, uh, Colin Powell. We all remember him, a very accredited politician uh, to begin with, and yet put all his credibility 
on the line of this argument toward the weapon of mass destruction inside Iraq and eventually uh, lost his glory in a way uh, with one incident uh, uh, out of a glorious life, uh, professional life. But, but Mr. Bland, uh, let me continue by asking you about this. So at this moment, how can we avoid another similar war will be built up, another campaign about so-called smoking gun, uh, another campaign about getting rid of another regime will be avoided. There is no I think by Mr. Blank, Mr. Blank, Mr. Blank go first. Pass, the Mr. way Blank, that the sorry. UK is doing. Um, I think it, by looking hard at the past the way the UK is doing, in the US right now there is no appetite at all for any foreign invasion. But in 10 years, in 20 years, that very well may change. Mm. I think we have to take a good hard look, not merely at the intelligence that was wrong, but why it was wrong. For example, you don't need top secret clearance to know that if you mix into one basket the categories of nuclear weapons and biological weapons, which Saddam had no, uh, never possessed, with chemical weapons, which he did possess, but did not pose any threat to the United States or Britain. If you make that analytical mistake, then you've already shifted the terms of the debate in a very gen dangerous way. Mm. Mr. Rovala, your thoughts here. My thinking is at the moment about the changes to the British political system. There are many debates that have come out of Chilcot about the ways in which one individual, Mr. Blair, was able to make decisions without any effective oversight. Parliamentarians, members of the cabinet, were not aware of things he was doing. And so in this context, a lot of the discussion has been about how to make leaders more accountable, not mm. just internationally, but also domestically for the actions that they, are, mm. they have taken. And that, I think, has been a major lesson that's come out of the Chilcot process. Talking about uh, the accountability of leaders, uh, of course, uh, we've been hearing that quote many times, but let's hear it again. According to the report, Tony Blair, then Prime Minister of the UK, wrote to George W. Bush, uh, then President of the United States, on July the 28th, 2002. He was suggesting this quote, I will be with you, whatever. It sounds uh, pretty much yes. like a promise between friends, but then uh, he, of course, warned yeah. uh, George W. Bush of the potential difficulties of the Iraq war, but eventually he still stood with uh, President Bush uh, on this uh, decision. Uh, okay. uh, Mr. Blank, the question is, what does it mean, personal relations or personal chemistry among state leaders vis-a-vis -vis the most important decisions they need to make for their own countries and even the world? <coughs> Yes, personal relations are very important, and the chemistry of political leaders is a, a very important element in decision making. The chemistry between President Bush and Prime Minister Blair was a very significant element in how some of the decisions were made, but uh, Prime Minister Blair's gamble that by trying to stick close to President Bush, he could therefore influence the outcome of decisions in Washington that appears, according to the Chilcot investigation, that appears uh, not to have been a successful strategy. Mm. Mr. Ravala, we've hear about, um, we've, yes. you know, Prime Minister Blair is a very charismatic figure. Uh, so was uh, when Prime Minister Cameron was making the decision when he was saying, let's have a referendum about uh, Brexit or not. Yes. So I think yes. it's a fundamental question, not just for the UK, not for the US, but rather the worldwide. What is the role of a politician? What power scope does he or she yes. have in making a decision for the whole country and even beyond? Ms. Robala. That's a very good question again. Um, and this was part of the whole reason why the Chilcot process has been so important because there has been a lot of mistrust generated as a result of the Iraq invasion. Many people since then have, have, have articulated their lack of confidence in political leadership. And many were looking to Chilcot to establish more reliable mechanisms for thinking about how people can have more trust mm. in politics, in political leadership. 
the answer to that is that there is no single answer. Chilcot by himself in one document, even though it's a very long document, cannot provide a formula for successful politics. There is no formula there, I don't think, that anybody could devise for how confidence can be restored in a situation in which um, a country like Britain has been involved mm. in a major foreign policy initi initiative that's gone so badly wrong. Right. So I don't think we can, we can find, we're going to find all the answers in Chilcot. Yeah, we can't. And especially answers about what to do with the Middle East. Uh, really, I have to go for your help, yeah. Mr. Mansour, and your expertise here. This is a Pandora box, as they say. The war in Iraq, 2003. A totally changed uh, paradigm inside the Middle East, and we've seen so many changes since then. Mr. Mansour, what do you make of what's being mentioned in the decision-making process build up to the war inside the UK? And how is that having an impact on your part of the world, for example, in Beirut and elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the 2003 war in Iraq uh, had a huge ripple effect throughout the Middle East, um, and, you know, as we've seen. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that most Iraqis actually wanted Saddam to go at the time, um, particularly the opposition group leaders who were in the, in the offices of mm. Bush and Blair telling them that Saddam needs to go. Now, the thinking was Saddam was in himself uh, a problem for Iraq and for the region to some extent. And so they wanted him to go. Um, so I think, and a lot of Iraqis today I know are kind of troubled with this question. Was it better before or after hmm. Saddam? And there is a certain element of nostalgia as well to, to Saddam. But I think that's a bit short-sighted. And I think that people shouldn't forget that Saddam himself was a dictator. Mm. And as we say, Iraq did not become a graveyard after 2003. It was a graveyard before 2003. I mean, he gassed the Kurds. He, he uh, hit the Shia quite, quite severely at times. Mm. So definitely from that aspect, it wasn't, you know, a rosy picture before 2003. Right. Yet. What happened after 2000? And th what happened after 2003? The U.S., the U.K., and the coalition decided to fundamentally remove the structure of government in Iraq, completely move the institutions of state, the army, the many of the civil servants, and so the country quickly fell apart, as, as I said. And as it fell apart, many actors were able to move in and, and emerge. And many of the problems we have today, you can someone trace them back to that decision. The you know the Islamic State doesn't come out of nowhere for example. Mm. The Islamic State comes from Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was Zarqawi, who was there before, who launched a, a war against the occupiers at that time. So many of the problems we're having today are because of that. The system of governance that was set up, the 2005 constitution that was created in Iraq, me created many of the problems we have today. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the more important points of the Chilcot report is how poorly planned Post into your know, post intervention, how poorly uh, the occupation was planned, that led to many of the problems we have right. today. Uh, Mr. Mansour, I have to follow up by asking you two important questions. Let's go one by one. First of all, should leaders around the world make the decision based on ideologies, and how dangerous it could be if they do? Meanwhile. Do we need to get rid of all the dictators in the world? We are still having, uh, according to at least the Western media, quite a number of them around the world. But the thing is, what is the kind of stories we are going to see after that? Should there be plan, and should others mm. plan for a country that is not their own? Mr. Mansour, I think these are all very credible questions and fundamental questions to be asked, Ms. Mansour. Mr. Mansour, we are having a problems uh, probably uh, have at the signals uh, at this moment. If, Mr. Blank, please come in. If you like, I can uh, take a, a bit of a stab at that. Go ahead. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Mansour was absolutely right about the failure by both the U.S. and Britain to plan for what happens after Saddam was removed from power. And there are a lot of uh, very bad rulers around the world. And one of the things the Chilcot report reminds us mm. is that simply removing a bad actor does not necessarily bring a better outcome. You have to have a plan. 
You have to have the buy-in of the country concerned and of its population. And you really have to chart out exactly what's going to happen, not just during the campaign, but after the dictator is removed. Mm. Of course, uh, that those are a lot of questions uh, and food for thought. Mr. Robala, what do you make of what I just asked of the other two gentlemen? Um, mm. at, at, at the moment, it is critical. What should be a political decision uh, yes. taking off a regime based on? And should others make the decision for, their con for others' country to make that decision? Yes. I, I think what Mr. Blank said was entirely right, that the, um, the Iraq situation shows what happens when there is limited planning for what happens after a government is, 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 um, it departs. Um, but what I also think is true is that there is no reliable mechanism for asserting order within a context which has lived with an authoritarian situation for better or, or for ill, for ill for the most part, as Mr. Mansour was saying, for a very long number of for, for a very large amount of time. Iraq had experienced forms of authoritarianism throughout its modern history. There is no mechanism that's yet been invented mm. that will reliably create a functioning democratic system. It, there is inevitably a level of risk and that level of risk was, I think, in the Iraq case, not properly evaluated. Mm. There wasn't a, a, a plan for what to do, but there wasn't also thinking about how likely it is that a, a better outcome will arise in this context. There wasn't a contingency in place for what happens if there is a popular uprising, right. as there was in late 2003 when I was there in Iraq. Mm. There, what, what to do in this context? There isn't, there isn't, there isn't clear thinking about it. Mm. So mm. one has to not just to think about what the best solution is, but what to do if your first plan doesn't work. But, but you know, Mr. Um, Rabala, in the Iraq case. Yes, yeah. it, it, Mr. Rabala, if I could uh, just come in here. It, is it possible for any outsider to really plan a hundred percent accurate plan for another country. Yeah. There is a lot the, of information that is, deficit. That is the, yeah, yeah, there yeah. is a lot of uh, yeah. deficit really regarding to the thinking styles. And also, it really depends on who you are talking to, who your sources are. As we all know, the sources are providing with the advice and the information with their own political purposes as well. So, is it possible, yes. the question is, uh, Mr. Rabala, for an outsider, whether it's a country or countries, to make a decision for another country. Is it possible and can that be in any way correct? As I was indicating, there, is a good, there are good reasons to be sceptical mm. of that possibility of anybody devising a system for not just their own country but also for another country on the basis of limited experience and inevitably a shallow level of knowledge when it's an outsider making those judgments. Mm. One of the interesting things about the Iraq inquiry, the, the Chilcot inquiry, is, is the elaboration of quite how little Britain knew about Iraq before 2003, mm. how they were acting on the basis of little knowledge of the country but still were making decisions that would affect every single person living in that country for generations to come. So that limited knowledge is a key problem in contexts where outside forces come to take charge of the institutions of another country. So mm. even if there had been lots of planning and lots of thinking, right. I don't think there's any guarantee that those plans would have been effective in restoring order and stability to I Iraq. see. And Mr. Mansour is now with us. I hope you can hear me well. Can you yes. hear? Uh, yes, Mr. I Mansour, can now we are not only just facing what is going on in Iraq, but also elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, Syria, for example, is another case study of uh, whether others should join in and plan for the country's future. And that is going to be an important step for the next step of your region in the Middle East. So what do you make of this? Outsiders come in, or actually we should let people inside the country to decide their own future, Mr. Mansour? It's, it's a very difficult question. I mean, many would say that outsiders are already in Syria to some extent, particularly regional outsiders, if you will. Um, it's hard to see. I mean, Syria originally was a very local problem. I've spoken to many Syrians uh, now in Lebanon or in Iraq, and it was a reform. They, they wanted reforms. Mm. However, it was to some extent hijacked by some stronger groups viewed as foreign-funded groups uh, that were able to emerge. Um, and so it kind of went from that lo a local problem to a much a regional problem. And all regional players are now have their, their, their hands in Syria. And again, this is a huge question. You know, 
know, and, and I think the Chilcot report is important for how we conceive and how we you know, of, of uh, intervention. Um, do we do we do we let Syria continue as it is? Um, and, and you know, it's now we have more than five hundred thousand who have died since since the conflict began. Right. Is there any responsibility to protect? I mean, these are all questions that uh, you know international lawyers, but also hum, you know human rights activists and other types of academ and academics are trying to answer. What needs to be done? And I don't think that there's an answer to it. Okay. It's hard to really see an answer from the ground of what should be done. Well, I'm sure our discussion will continue because all of these important questions do not have sufficient answers. But for now, I want to thank all of you, the three of you, so much for your insights and your perspectives. Uh, Glenn Ravala, Renette Mansour, and also Jonah Blank. Really thank appreciate you. gentlemen for being with us.